Hello, this is Dean Radin, and I'm on Your Superior Self. Hi, I'm Anita Morjani, and this is Your Superior Self. Hello, this is Dr. Raymond Moody, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, cultural creatives. I'm Bruce Lipton, and I'm here to join you with Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Paul Selig, and this is Your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is Your Superior Self. What is up, guys? Welcome back. I'm Trey Downs, and you're listening to Your Superior Self, the podcast that helps us remember that the greatness that we seek is right here within us. And to help us remember that today, I have Tess Whitehurst joining the show, the best-selling author of the new book, The Self-Love Superpower, The Magical Art of Approving of Yourself No Matter What. How important is that? Unconditional self-love, unconditional self-approval, unconditional self-trust. We talk a lot about that in this episode. We talk a lot about spirituality. We talk about what that looks like for us, some self-practical ways of meditating and breaking through some of our barriers that that do not allow us to self-love and to give us some context in this conversation. Here's a small clip. But then over time, it becomes to me, my experience of spirituality is this, it's very subtle. And it's incremental, but it's consistently opening up more and more joy, more and more freedom by just simply, I mean, it's very simple. It's not, I mean, I, yes, I have, I have experiences like you where I see images or receive messages or downloads, but I feel like the real gold of the spiritual path is, is the the very, the everyday simplicity of listening, listening to silence or looking at the sky in identifying with the mystery, like, what Mm. is this? What is going on? (laughs) What is going on here? Who am I? And then it's like, the answer is infinity. The answer is the mystery. It's something that transcends our human logic, but we can still through meditation, through spending time in nature, through setting the intention, we can still sense it even if we can't understand it consciously or explain it consciously, we can sense that space, that oneness, that, that possibility. I love all of that. And as I sit here and I sip my coffee early in the morning after a morning run, I feel very, very motivated to go on a rant. And I'm, very, I'm trying to hold myself back. But the simplicity of the mystery of life, it's so simple. Why are we here? And no one can really answer that but yourself. I mean, I think we all, we all at some point in our development of consciousness come to the, our own answers of that question. I don't think any one answer is the right answer. I think it's, it's all in the eye of the perceiver. It's all of our perceptions and our understanding of where we're at in life and in general. Our experiences alone teach us so much about who we are as this individual point of consciousness, our own personalities and as I went for my run today, like I had this amazing feeling of gratitude towards every situation that I've ever encountered in my life because it's gotten me to where I'm at right now speaking to you currently in this point of reality. And I don't have any resentment of any experience that I've perceived because of this, it, because of the development, because of the education that I've gained through that. Everything, everything has been a breadcrumb from the universe pointing me into this direction. And I think that through self-love, you know, through the concepts that we talk about in this episode, unconditional self-love gives you that power of self-empowerment, of self-realization, of self-love, of knowing and loving yourself for this, this knowledge that everything that you've experienced has been for your gain, everything. Even the worst of times, even the worst, think about back to the worst point in your life. It has, it has added to who you are. It has added to your experience. It has added to your consciousness awareness. It has added to the development of the universe just through your own experience. And that to me is the greatest gift that anyone can ever receive. And it might be hard for you to understand that or accept that because of your attachment to that experience but if you let go of that attachment and you sit back and you realize that this is for 
a greater awareness of experience, then there is nothing that you cannot accept as, as it just being, as it just being that experience because of that, letting that in and allowing yourself to feel that is it's, it's its own gift in itself. And I know it's, it's easy to say that, and it's easy for me to, you know, look back on my life and say these things because I haven't experienced probably what you've experienced. I, I can only say it from the standpoint of where I'm at in my life and my viewpoint and my standpoint of my reality currently. But these are the concepts. Like, if you can get past the ego who, who tells us that we have to be certain things and that we, you know, prioritizes things in a manner that is important to itself, if you can eliminate that, feeling of having to label things and how and having to have things in the name of having things then you can stand in a in a point of reference of no beingness if you can eliminate that ego if you can eliminate the the identity that the character that you play in this drama of life and you can look at it from a viewpoint of just being then there is nothing good or bad that happens to us, really. It's just an experience. And then it's up to the perceiver of that experience to interpret that or define that as good or bad. But what is good or bad is what we label it to be. What is bad? It's just what we've titled as bad experiences. What is good? It's what we've titled as good experiences. And if you eliminate those definitions of those experiences, it just is. And that just is, accumulates over time. And that's where the education, that's where the information flow comes from for us as consciousness. I know that seems like some incredible, uh, incredible nonsense, but I just had to go down that rant. I had to go down that rabbit hole with you guys because it's just important for me. Uh, that's, That's what I was inspired to talk about. But if you want to find out more about Tess Whitehurst, you can follow her on all social media. She's on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. She, her new book, uh, The Self-Love Superpower, The Magical Art of Approving of Yourself No Matter What is out. I highly suggest that you go out and buy it because it has practical methods for us to apply to our daily lives. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So without further ado, I don't want to take up much more of your time because <laughs> I am fired up this morning. Here is my conversation with the great and the powerful Tess Whitehurst. Hi, this is Tess Whitehurst, and this is your superior self. Tess, self-love. I am excited to talk about this. Thank you for joining the show. Thanks for having me. So your new book, The Self-Love Superpower, The Magical Art of Approving of Yourself, No Matter What. Um talk about that. Like what sparked that? Well, so I had a birthday where I was very sad. (laughs) I often had birthdays where I was very sad. I didn't know why, um, but I just kind of felt depressed on my birthdays. I've recently figured that out, but this year I had a bad birthday and I mentioned it on my podcast. And then there was an email we received or a message we received about how someone was surprised that I would have a bad day Mm -hmm. since I had written a number of books about magical and spiritual living and, you know, have guided meditations on YouTube. And so I realized I had kind of left out a really big, important part of my spiritual path in my writings and work. And that was the imperfect nature of the spiritual path. Like the, the way that we're all making mistakes and feeling, having ups and downs all the time and learning to love ourselves through that and learning to create space in order to hear our intuition, to have patience with that process, to have compassion with ourselves through it. That's really the spiritual path. The spiritual path is not arriving at this place where you're always happy. Hmm. Isn't that like the fallacy of it though? Like like, spiritual enlightenment is it, the finish line, and then you're done, right? Yeah, that's it. You win. 
no it's yeah. like a, an ever going thing right like the next there's always a next level i feel like oh yeah if we're still here right mm. if we're st- i mean there must be more to learn and more ways to evolve if we're still alive on earth as a human All right um let's talk about that like your spiritual awakeness your your spirituality like have you always been you know pursuing that like what did your earlier life look like and when did you become like fascinated with consciousness with self-love with everything that you're about yeah that's a really good question so i um when i was in high school i found buddhism i lived in a small town like a rural town where there and we it was before everyone had the internet And the only kind of alternative spirituality I could find was Buddhism. But before that, I, my mom took me to church and she had a real, real, like she had a deep fear of possession and Satan and demons. And I just absorbed this terror of um, being possessed, of being a bad person. I mean, going to hell And then when I was, I guess, like, maybe it was my first year of high school when I became an atheist. So then I became an atheist and that was so liberating, but I think I still just always had this spiritual, this like fascination, this draw. And when I read about, oh, you know what? Actually, my mom had like, she got a Buddhist book in the mail. It was like a book club and I read it. It was the Tibetan book of living and dying. And then I was like, I love this. And so then I started meditating when I was in high school. And then after that, when I was in uh, acting school in Pasadena, California, then I had access to bookstores and I learned about all number of spiritualities after that. Atheism. Hmm. That's pretty, I mean, for a young, young girl, I mean, anybody young, right? Like, I mean, I grew up in a, in a small town, right? And so, I mean, we all get programmed at a very early age to, I think, not, well, maybe not all of us, but a majority of us get programmed to go into church and go to Sunday school and do these things. And it's all fear-based, right? We go do these things because we are fearful we won't go to heaven. Yeah. Um. So atheism, was that kind of like, uh, like a revolting type of selection for you? Was it like, I'm going to be atheist because I don't believe anything that you're saying. And I think that there's something different out there or maybe there's not nothing out there. Yeah. I mean, I think it was at a point where my mom was kind of like laying off the spirituality for just a brief moment before she dove back in, (laughs) but she was laying off of it for a minute. And my dad's always been like pretty supportive of me thinking for myself. So I, I don't think I didn't feel like I was rebelling against them at that time, but I did feel like I was rebelling against like just the mainstream the sort machine. of message. Yeah. The machine. <laughs> the machine. Yeah. And yeah, totally. And also, um, and against, I mean, it, it felt like a liberating thing to be like, not having to worry about an afterlife, mm-hmm. about any sort of invisible. It's just that was a, it had been such an uncomfortable thing. Is to that me, so. the same? I guess it's not. The, well, is it the same? I guess maybe it's not the same thing as nihilism, right? Like a nihilist believes there is no meaning, right? Like there is no meaning to this. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I, that's my understanding of nihilism is something like that. So like, an atheist no. doesn't believe in an afterlife or anything. They believe that an, an atheist, and I could be wrong. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming that they believe that there is no afterlife nor God. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that some atheists have like some agnosticism in there, which is like, mm-hmm. I just don't know. Um, I think technically atheism means I don't believe in God. I believe there is no God. Well, isn't like most fear based communities who hear the word atheism they automatically believe that they're satanists and like they Uh, worship you know like i feel like a lot of people who because there's a lot of scientists that are atheists you know yeah like same category like just very bad they they just don't know (laughs) right like they're they just don't know because of their scientific roots um did you so when did you i mean what is your belief system now do you believe in a 
uh, higher levels of consciousness, uh, universe, cosmos, God, what do you, what do you believe? Yeah. I mean, I feel very, um, pro science and really respectful and understanding of atheism and agnosticism. I also feel a sense that it is inspiring to me to connect with infinity, which Mm -hmm. is consciousness, like infinite. I think of it like infinite consciousness, which also we all are a part of, like, if we really think about what is it like to have consciousness, it's neutral. I mean, things arise within it, feelings and thoughts and opinions and pain or pleasure or things we're seeing or are just imagining. I mean, things arise within the consciousness, but the consciousness itself is infinite and universal and connecting with that spacious sort of openness to me that is a kind of theism it's like something that is bigger than my human self that I am one with and that there are different ways to access that but as humans it's also difficult for us to understand to contemplate to like hold it in our consciousness this idea of an infinite consciousness. So if there are v- different ways that we're able to connect with that or different visions of the divine or different names for the divine that help us to connect with different aspects of the divine, then that is okay. I think it's just for me, it's um, the underlying awareness of that infinite consciousness. When did you like become so in, 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 coherence with that right like when when so you get from atheism you start reading a lot of different books spirituality yeah. buddhism like was it then like do you ever have a re- like an experience with consciousness a higher levels of consciousness the oneness do you have that like that kind of you know from from believing to knowing like yeah like, what yeah does that i look mean like so there are there have been moments like specific significant moments i wouldn't say I wouldn't call any of them like an enlightenment moment because I kind of don't like, I I just made a video about how I don't think it's helpful for us to have that concept. Like we're talking about, like Mm -hmm. you did it, you won, but I have had moments that were especially opening. uh, And one of them you may have read about in my book was when I was on acid Mm -hmm. and I was, um, in the car, my friend was driving. Did you get to that part yet? Yep. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was, um, just really feeling very bad. I mean, I was so identified with my thoughts and my thoughts were incessant. They were negative. They were self condemning, self critical. And it was so uncomfortable. I just couldn't sit with it. And then I now think of it as my higher self showed me how to allow those thoughts to be there, not fight them, not argue with them, just let them be there. But then to realize that's not you, like you don't have to identify. I feel like that was a moment that was really formative for me when I just, I just saw that dynamic and understood that dynamic where it was like, you could have a real uncomfortable monologue in your head, but if you realize that's not who you are, your infinite mm-hmm. consciousness, then it becomes so much less uncomfortable. <laughs> it's, it just becomes more bearable. Yeah. Uh, you're, and I think in the book, you, you, you name it, the ego, right? Like everyone mm-hmm. knows, I, I, maybe some people on the show haven't really identified that ego separate from who they are really. I mean, what we are truly, um, because it's hard, right? Because, you know, I, in a couple of recent episodes, we talk about like, uh, how do you communicate with that self, a yeah, higher self? And that, uh, for me, it looks like meditation, quieting, yeah. you know, sitting still, you know, um, be still and know that I am God, right? Like yeah. silence it all out, silence your mind and you start tapping into that source, that mm-hmm. consciousness, right? Like, like, I, I don't know who said this, but they were like, silence is the voice of God or something like that. Like, you're not going to hear a lot of the times enlightenment or what people term as light enlightenment is not like some loud voice coming to you and giving you a message. Usually it's very 
um, very subtle, right? Like very mm -hmm. subtle images or downloads or visions that happen through meditation or flow states or whatever it is that you love. And you, it's kind of like your job really, right? To kind of decipher that, whatever that looks like for you and apply it to your life because it always, you can always apply that message to your life directly. I have experienced that, right? Like, it's, mm -hmm. I don't know for a lot of people, some people who have the five clairs, if you want to call it that, that have a lot of, um, you know, psychic abilities or things like that, that can do a whole lot of different things that I can't do <laughs> with their intuition, um, might get different messages. But for me, and I think for most people who struggle with like, you know, the left brain coming in and saying, well, this isn't right. This isn't true. Like this is just you making up stories or you're just making up that voice or you're just making up these images just because you want to feel like there is a message for, for you from the universe. And you kind of got to let that go. You kind of, mm -hmm. you kind of got to like check that ego, like you're talking about in your experience in the book and kind of just know that, you know, through your heart, through your right here, this heart center that, you also got to like kind of trust that too. Like, and, and I've been, I've been, I've been struggling with trust, not just with externals my, during my life, but with myself as well, as well. Right. You got to trust that higher self that you're getting these, these, I call them divine images or divine connections in divine timing in your life. And that's when you can apply it. Like it doesn't hit you right away. Like when you walk away from that meditation, it kind of like, it's like a day later you're, you're walking or you're doing, you're in a situation. You're kind of like, go back to that meditation. You're like, Holy crap. Like th this is what that meant. Right. Like, mm -hmm. this is why I got that. And I didn't mean to go on a rant, but it's just like, Oh no. I, yeah. I, That's I just, interesting. <laughs> so yeah. So when you meditate, are you um, saying that you sometimes like see images or hear words and then they have significance for you later? Yeah. So like I yeah. kind of, I go, places like I'll, I'll listen to a beach meditation and then I'm all, all of a sudden I'm at the beach and then I'm sitting on the beach and I'll have like, you know, obviously not obviously, obviously, cause people don't know what is going on with me and my meditations, but I will have like visions or like conversations with whether, whatever, you know, either Jesus or God or Buddha or whomever, um, a higher, um, uh, ascended master, if you want to call it that. And it, it, it usually is pretty enlightening for me. Um, maybe not in that moment, but at some point during the day or the next following day, I'll have an experience that relates directly to that. Yeah. Yeah. How, what does it look like for you? Well, so I think for, I, I sometimes will tap into intuition in a similar way where I'll listen deeply and, um, and, and receive sort of downloads of information or words or images, um, with the daily meditation, which I recommend to all of your listeners and everybody to do a daily meditation. Um, that to me is a similar thing that I was talking about with my hallucinogenic experience. You definitely don't need to do hallucinogens in order to have that. And it is shifting. It's like a, like water dripping on a stone. It's teaching you, your mind, your spirit to identify with infinity rather than the human monologue. So mm. it's like the ego I talk about in the book is I think a good definition for the ego is the illusion of separation. So we all have that. It's just a part of being human. It, we, it, it appears that I'm separate from you and I'm separate from the sky and my cat. But in reality, our, we're all interconnected and we are interconnected with pure spirit and consciousness. So when we meditate, that bringing your mind back to the breathing, like just that, like, okay, now I'm breathing in, now I'm breathing out. And now my mind is wandering. Oops. Okay. I'll bring it back to so breathing in, breathing out, feeling my weight on the cushion or the floor. Like that is that, yeah, my voice is there. My thoughts are there, but let me just keep bringing it back just to being here in the space, listening to silence, listening to my breath. And then over time that puts you in a space where, yeah, you have a human experience, you have ups and downs, but you know who you really are, which is infinity. Mm, 
so it's so powerful because like, like i want to know that i want to have a knowing right like i have yeah. all of these i i i have all these like i can read your book i can read you know a thousand other books and hear about or read about people's experiences with consciousness with this this of this feeling of oneness right like this they're they 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 somehow you know float over their bodies and they can see their body and they can see themselves as everything you know the mountains the river the sun the beach just everything you know the the, the sand is the water the, the water is the sand kind of moment where everything is connected but it's like i guess that knowing for me like that's where the trust comes in for me right and like reading your look your book about self-love and then reading some other other pieces of work like michael j rhodes i don't know if you ever heard of him or not i just found him he talks about like, you know, the same thing you're talking about, like having an unconditional love for yourself, regardless mm -hmm. of what happens. And it's hard because a lot of people are their worst enemies. You know, you're talking about the ego. You have some mm -hmm. really good examples of that in the book um, throughout your journey um, where you're just just harping on things you know you're you're dumb you're stupid you're not good enough blah 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 and then like you know you go to work and you you know, you hear it from your boss and, and you, you mess up on an, uh, like in a, a project or something, or you mess up in your relationships or whatever. And you're like hating on yourself, throwing shade on yourself the entire time. And this guy's like, yeah, no, no I love myself totally unconditionally. No matter what it is that I do, I have always forgive myself. And I always think, and I know that I'm a metaphysical multi-dimensional being and that is just so magnificent in itself how can i hate that how can i right. you know like yeah i mean you put a yeah. lot of examples in the book as well i mean was it when did you get to that point because i'm just now like starting like i'm 38 I, i'm just starting to unconditionally love myself oh yeah no i feel like i i also i mean it's an ongoing journey like i say in the book it's spiraling it's not a straight path to the top of the mountain so i had different degrees of it but i feel like it has been in the last i don't know four or five years that and i'm 44 where i'm really you know starting to see because i think a good gauge is when you think of like your, your kids, like you have kids. I saw your picture. I saw your bio. <laughs> so like you think of your kids, you don't think, oh, I, I would love you only you made this mistake today, or I would love you only you don't look exactly, you know, your eyes aren't pretty enough or something, <laughs> you know, you okay. would never. And like, that's that same way that I think when we can think of loving ourselves, like cultivating a love that is like, it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with conditions. Because I think it's also confusing because the word love, I mean, our culture in general, we have a lot of like, There's a lot, lot of, boxes. of, There's a lot yeah, of boxes. boxes, messages we get. Um, but then the, the word love, I think can be a little confusing because we, when we think of loving a person, that is just like, I, I want you to know, I love you no matter what no matter what you look like, no matter what mistakes you make, I love you. We just feel that unconditional love when we really love someone. But then we also use the word to say like, oh, I love your jacket. I love that t-shirt. And it's like, that is totally another thing. That is a preference. That's an opinion. And so noticing like that is not like, do you love your body is not like the same as do you love that t-shirt? It's do it's like, do you love your daughter? Yes, you love your daughter no matter what she looks like. Like this is our bodies are our these loyal, these loyal beings that are taking care of us, taking us from one place to another, doing everything they possibly can to support our life as a human on earth. So for us to cultivate a love of our bodies, a love of our our soul, our uniqueness like how we're showing up in the world, even when we make mistakes. And I feel like thinking about, again, like a daughter or son or a partner or brother or sister, you know, if, if sometimes when they make mistakes or they have imperfections, like so-called imperfections, it's like a, it doesn't make us love them more, but it does help us feel that love. Like I just, I, it's like opens your heart to them more in a way. And I feel like we can, 
And I, I have, and I love that I have gotten to a point where I have opened my heart to myself in that way. Mm. What was it like that you were, that was limiting yourself from loving yourself? You know, I think that the, a big key for kind of, I mean, I always have thought I, I valued the concept of self-love and I feel like I did get closer and closer and learn a lot of things all along the way. But I think I really started feeling like I was cultivating it in a deep way, this unconditional love when I discovered the anti-diet movement, which I know you've had a guest that was talking about the anti-diet movement because I had felt so like just, I just didn't realize like how much I had internalized this idea of how important it is, how my body looks and how much it weighs. And then like how good of a person I am based on how healthy I eat. And when I learned about the anti-diet movement and I started deprogramming myself from that hypnotism, Mm. it helped me, I think in other ways to be like, how else can I unconditionally Mm. love and support myself and let myself be who I am and look how I look, you know, there's so many programs, like there's just so many programs. Yeah. We're just so, we're so unconscious of like, it just like, uh, like, and we don't realize it. What's in our, con- like the shadow, right? Like what Carl Jung, <clears throat> Carl yeah. Jung used to call the shadow. We don't really, we don't even know what's there. Yeah. What the programs are because we're conscious like that 1% of consciousness that we are during the day or, or what we are right now, we have no idea what lies in there. Right. And so it's like through dreams, it's through meditation, it's through flow states it's some people it looks like uh psychedelics i mean a lot of people work through their shadow through psychedelics because that's when it comes up that's when Mm -hmm. you deal with the shadow and you got to deal with it but there's so much liberation in that once you start seeing the programs and you start realizing what they are i mean i think it like i was reading a book and they were like some guy was questioning his livelihood and he was like why am i doing this like why am i going to work What is the reason? Why am I going to work? Fear is the reason Mm -hmm. why you're going to work. Why do you, what do you fear? He's like, you know, I'm not, I don't fear. I'm not going to work because of fear. Yes, you are because you you're going and you're checking in because you're fearful that you're not going to have a paycheck, that you can't support your family, that you can't do this and this and that. And you're not trusting the being in which you are like that you have to, and that's where trust comes in. Like knowing, right? Like to unconditionally trust yourself is showing up every day, knowing that your higher self is going to take care of you and that you're going to get through it. And the the universe is going to show you your way. Like, you can't just be like, all right, I I quit. Like, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm going to quit my job tomorrow and blah, blah, blah. You have to trust that the way, whatever that looks like, will come and you keep showing up for that regardless of what it is. And that's like, that was my biggest epiphany was like fear. It's everything that I've done was based off of fear of not having enough, not doing enough, not being successful enough. And like, I was, um, you know, when I first started the podcast, it was all about trying to be successful, trying to get the downloads, trying to market it, try to put it in this box and say, this is what it is fear because I wasn't good enough. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was driving me and it was in a lot of, it drives a lot of people fear. But then when you step back and you look at it and you look at society and you're like, man, everything is driven by fear, everything. And that's when you kind of step back from that illusion, which is our reality right now, which our society is an illusion because it is driven off of fear. And you kind of step back and you realize I am again, a multidimensional phenomenal being and this is going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And, and I could perish tomorrow and I will be somewhere else that is going to be um, magnificent. And it's going to be a learning you know, experience for myself. And I'm going to be able to recollect and I'm going to be able to, you know, as you put it, infinity, right? Be infin- you know, there is no mm-hmm. beginning. There is no end. Like continue on this path of higher consciousness. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And also I think I was feeling from what you were saying, like when you love and approve of yourself unconditionally, then 
that feels easy. It's like, I don't have, I mean, I, I will go to work because I, it, it shifts the reason you go to work. Like I'm going to go to work because at this moment, this is the best option for me to help take care of myself and my family. And I love myself and I don't have to do anything. I don't have to have my, my life look any particular way in order to have my life be valuable, to have it be, to, to just be worthy of love, to have my life amount to something like that whole idea of amounting to something. It's like, it already does. You already do exactly. when you love yourself. And when you know that, and then that is like, you know, you will listen deeply to what you need and to be kind to yourself. And maybe sometimes you'll forget, and then you'll be kind to yourself when you remember. And then the more you can learn to do that and listen to yourself and take care of yourself, then your life begins to shift and not be guided by fear. Sure. And I should totally put a disclaimer out. I don't want people to go quit their jobs, but this guy had realized that he hated his job and he was like, why am I doing this? Who am I? Yeah. But he brought consciousness to yes. it. Yes. And then he was able to shift it, not probably necessarily by quitting right away, but it's like just by seeing, oh, this is my internal motivation. I don't want to be motivated by that. So let me shift that and then take steps in a healthy way that doesn't jeopardize my livelihood. But you can right away shift your inner environment, even if it doesn't make sense to shift everything in the outer environment right away. Yeah. But then again, it's like the ego, right? The, the ego fears off the fear. And so like, let's say you're doing a job that you hate and you're like, you can't get out of that rut. And it's like, why am I continuing? You know, but you see, you, you see throughout the day, like how your mind is reacting from the fear. Like I'm, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm never going to be able to go back to school. I'm never going to be able to alter, you know, change my path because of I'm not good enough or you're not good enough, or, you know, you don't have enough money or blah, blah, blah. Um, you got to step back and say, this is just, this is fear. Like, this is just me. You know, fear is the whip. It is cracking the uh -huh. whip on me. And once you step back and you, you, re you realize this, it's, an, it's all an illusion, right? Like you are greater than what you think you are. Like you are a hundred percent greater, this greater being that is right here having this experience and <clears throat> trust yourself like a hundred percent, like like trust, do, do sign up for a class or, or do something different and, and see how the universe responds. And then like when you were talking about in your book, um, when you start loving yourself unconditionally and you start having that self-love, like I've noticed it for myself just by having that love for myself and like, you know, just, you know, just speaking to myself and just pumping myself up and just loving myself, not the emotion, but like the, the you know, love is the power of creation when I do that, I, I notice things in my life change, like my energy is changing. Right. So like things are vibrating differently. So like things are happening. Like my wife took the trash out. The other <laughs> my wife has never, my wife has never taken the trash out ever. And I come home from work and she, there's trash. I mean, all of the trash is out on the curb. I'm like, Hmm, I have to chalk this up to me loving myself. Because wow. this never, ever like, so yeah. I mean, you write about There's it in the proof, book, right? right like you write about it in the book, right? Like in your experience, like in your in your in your energy field, have you noticed things change when you start loving yourself more? Yeah, everything shifts. I mean, everything is easier. Everything feels safer, and it does. Like the it it is that process too. Like when you were talking about the fear, I think it. I mean, self love is also noticing. Like, okay, there's fear. This is shadow work too. Like there's fear that I'm identifying, but that isn't me. I am not that fear. It's just the rising there. And then, and then that gives you so much more agency. It opens up so many more possibilities, but in general, yeah, self-love helps to shift. It puts you in a more receptive state so that it's easier for blessings to flow to you. It's easier for the universe with whom you are one to come in and co-create with you. Have, besides the acid trip, have you done anything like any type of uh, breath work or meditations where you were uh, conscious of the oneness or in unity with it? Or is it just limited to that one experience? Oh yeah. No, I mean, I, th I feel like always meditation, every meditation, every time I go outside walking in nature, 
it's more subtle now. Like that was a situation where <laughs> it was an emergency. So shifting out of that discomfort was like really noticeable. Like, oh, this is very different. There is much more space and freedom here. But then over time, it becomes to me, my experience of spirituality is this, it's very subtle and it's incremental, but it's consistently opening up more and more joy, more and more freedom by just simply, I mean, it's very simple. It's not, I mean, I guess I have, I have experiences like you where I see images or receive messages or downloads, but I feel like the real gold of the spiritual path is, is the, the very, the everyday simplicity of listening, listening to silence or looking at the sky and identifying with the mystery. Like what mm. is this? What is going on? <laughs> what is going on here? Who am I? And then it's like, the answer is infinity. The answer is the mystery. It's something that transcends our human logic, but we can still through meditation, through spending time in nature, through setting the intention, we can still sense it. Even if we can't understand it consciously or explain it consciously, we can sense that space, that oneness, that, that possibility. Yeah. It's so hard to describe. Like you can't even name it. Like, like I even hate to say like the word God, because it's like the, the word itself is just limiting to that. Yeah. Right. And, mm -hmm. and like, um, and it's crazy because like, you know, how you sit in like silence or you calm your, your thoughts and you have this awareness, right? Like you have this, cause I'm just new to this idea of like, you know, I was listening to was, uh, Suzanne Giesman and Paul Selig's new book. And, uh, Suzanne was like, you know, she channels an entity named, uh, Sanaya and Sanaya, she, came through and or the, the collective came through and was like um you're not you're not the ocean and you're not the wave you are the ocean waving right like each mm, person mm -hmm. each person is what the ocean waving uh just an, an individual consciousness point of that and i was like okay that's cool like and then like i was reading paul Selig stuff and then like he started referring to us as that universal consciousness of like this inside of me my higher self, everything that I am, my collective consciousness is, is Christ consciousness essentially. Right. Like that. And I was, uh, I was like taken back. I was like blown. I was like, what? Like, I've, cause I started having medita meditations about, you know, having, <clears throat> having conversations with Jesus. And like, you know, obviously I grew up with a, a Christian background and he would say, you know, I would say, you know, people listen to the show or like, stop talking about this Trey, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> is like I would say, I love you. And he says, well, if you love me, then you love yourself. And I would, okay. Mm -hmm. And then like, I never really got that. And I never really understood that. And he's mm -hmm. just like, you know, you've always worshiped me. You never really loved me. Um, you were it, because of fear. It was a fear based love. It was kind of like, if you want to go to heaven, you're going to love me. But, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to do that. Like I, I know how to worship you. I know how to say, ask for forgiveness, but I don't know how to love you. But his whole message to me was like, him and I are not different. We are the yeah. same. We are the yes. same. And I didn't know what that meant. I was just kind of like, oh, well, he just, you know, he's just another human being just like me. Maybe that's what he meant. But it wasn't that at all. It was, mm -mm. it was that the, the entity, the, the consciousness that flows through my body that moves, you know, that moves this hand, that moves this mouth, that flows through my mouth, through, through this brain is, is this consciousness that is something that uh, doesn't originate in the brain originates, you know, who knows where it is the universe, the cosmos, and it's um, a part of my being and my soul, my entity, my spirit is of that. And mm -hmm. when that bomb dropped, Oh, I was just like, I'm still kind of dealing with it because I think ah. I'm still, I'm, I'm still dealing with it because it's like, it's like, it's a, like going to the next level each time that I contemplate this, it's like, so if I'm that and you and I are connected to that, is it really like when I'm sitting and going back to my point, I'm sorry, I'm like going around, you know, no, this is fascinating. Like when I quiet my mind enough and I am that awareness that I am awareness where there is no thought, there is nothing but silence and it's pure, like just awareness. Am I that and you too, right? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, like, so take this out of it, take this condition personality, take this, these thoughts, these experiences, these life experiences, and take this consciousness now out. And am I that in you? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like that's the yes. thing that I'm struggling with right now. Yes. It's, like, it's crazy. Like, it's just, it, it, like, this could be me over there looking at myself, talking to myself. It's like how freaky that is. I don't know. A lot of people yeah. might think I'm nuts right now, but it's like, no. I have these thoughts. I'm like, what if that's me? What if that's like, the, it, the, I just don't, because I've had my life experiences as Trey, as I've had that conditioning, I have this experience of separateness. This is my body. But when I leave that body, I expand more, you know, from what the mystics say and from what Buddhism says and what a lot of the, the great ascended masters say, if I am that, then could I, or could my being project itself in another person? I don't know. It's crazy. Like my mind yeah. is exploding on some of this stuff over here. Well, because I think that the spiritual path for me, it, there is, I think it's helpful to think of a duality that there are two levels of reality. And one is that I'm a human. I am a human named Tess and you're a human named Trey. And we are in different bodies in different States. And then there's a truer, much truer eternal reality, which is that we're all one consciousness. It's the same consciousness as divine consciousness. So I feel like that's what we're doing when we're meditating, when we're spending quiet time in nature, when we're doing shadow work, just any kind of way that we're getting in touch with spirit is we're putting energy and attention into that dual, that side of the duality, that true part. And then we can be in the world. We can be like, oh yeah, I'm Tess and this is my life. This is my job. I'm going to, this is how my hair looks and I'm going to brush it. (laughs) You know, like we can deal with the day-to-day stuff, but it feels more fun because it's like, oh, it's kind of like, oh, let's play at being this today. It's not, there's not real deep seriousness to it. If I feel heartbroken, it's like it's in the context of infinity and eternity. And it also helps us to have empathy with others. But it's really interesting to me that you're saying that because I was just talking to my boyfriend about that when we went, we were at a restaurant and I had read in, I, I don't remember where, New York Times by something, this article about how we didn't miss like during the pandemic, it wasn't that we missed restaurants because we missed the food. It was that we missed looking at people. Like that's why we like to go to restaurants so we can kind of like look around and see who else is there. And I was talking to him about like, yeah, that is so great because it is kind of like looking at different versions of yourself. Like, oh, there, there I am. And there I am. And there I am. And what, I wonder what my life is like in, in that reality. It's just an interesting way to kind of kind of contemplate the consciousness split into this prismatic like human experience you know kind of blows my mind though because like when i say things like you know um i want to do this or i want to do that and and, or i want to be that you know i'm going back to school and when i graduate i want to you know do different things in psychology and i want to you know i want this podcast to, to you know and a lot and i'm struggling with that because it's a lot of ego stuff too right like i want to be able and people say or I believe like I'm trying to decipher what is truth for me. And I hear a lot of people say we're here to create and we're here on this, in this reality to create, be creators. And I'm in like, you hear a lot of different things about, well, if I am that consciousness, if I am the, I am, then how can I not manipulate reality for myself and, and create the reality that I want? And I'm just like, well, you know what, let's, let's go, let's go hit this home run. Let's hit this grand slam you know, to ultimately know that I am the, I am and create a reality that's, that's going to shake me to my core and say, yeah, buddy, you're, you're that. Right. So, but I don't know if that's the ego. I don't know if that's the ego saying, well, you know, let's do this and you know, we want this, or is it because the more that I find myself loving myself more like unconditionally and trusting myself unconditionally, the more I let go of the rope, like I, the mm-hmm. more I let go of that, oh, I have to, um, you know, that reality that I want to change it into, I more, I let go of that more and I'm more in the moment and I'm more like, I mean, enjoying this because I know what it is. Like, I know that 
the society that is surrounding me right now is is nothing but illusion like that reality a lot of people are living that are still kind of sleeping to um that is not truth right like that's Mm -hmm. not my truth so the more that i going back to your book the the self-love superpower the more that i do that the more that i let go of the ego the more i let go of the of the, the reality that i need to have because right now in this moment like there's not a better feeling in the world knowing that we are higher beings of consciousness and that we're here right now experiencing this this flow of this art right like you and i having a conversation these people listening to this conversation probably wondering what the hell we're talking about but (laughs) (laughs) but there's nothing better because it's it's that's creation yeah that is ultimately you know to feel that's freedom yeah yeah Yeah. i think yeah you're right on with that because i think it's when we concentrate on that feeling that we want manifesting the feelings we want rather than the way we want it to exactly look like this is how many downloads I get on my podcast every week. Exactly. When it's more like, Oh, what is the feeling there? Oh, it's the feeling of expansion and communication and joy and, you know, connected, connecting with creativity and the divine then it's like you're letting yourself co-create with yourself. It's like your infinite self is co-creating with your finite self. You know, and when you have both, when you have like, yeah, I know I'm an ego, but I'm also regularly remembering I'm also infinity. Then it's this beautiful dance. Mm. Yeah, it's a dance for sure. I mean, it, it, that is reality, really. I mean, re- not reality, but it's like what you're in, like this reality that I'm in is a dance. It's like surfing. It's like, you know, you, but it feels so real, right? Like people can yeah. attest to this. Like you start going through some shit and then it's like you get locked into the moment and you're like, you're lost. You forgot that self. You forgot the higher self. Now you think you're the individualized conscious. Yeah, now I think I'm Trey Downs. You know, now I think I am my my, you know, I think I am in my, my environment, everything. Why is this happening to me? What is going on? Mm-hmm. And until I can step back and kind of recollect myself and then re- remember, um, it just, it's like, man, that felt real. Like that mm-hmm. felt like, like really, really real. And it's, I'm telling you until you can unconditionally trust that higher self and know that it has your best interest, like regardless, even if it's a hard interest, like, it is there's a lesson to be learned like even if like let's say i mean i don't know let's say i say all right i'm I'm going to unconditionally trust myself and i am going to put all of that energy into um my higher self and i'm going to trust whatever happens next and let's say next thing you know i get fired from my job let's just say that that happens for you regardless because that is the unfolding of a cosmic universal plan that is now you've accepted this this higher being this 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 challenge from the universe to trust it because now it's like okay you want to trust me guess what buddy we're gonna we're gonna find out how much you trust me and sometimes you waver and sometimes you you keep you get back to that that spot of and like (laughs) why is this happening to me (laughs) what is going Mm -hmm. on but then again like unconditionally trusting that the universe has your best interest at heart and then loving yourself on top of that like there's no other way to come out of it but to be positive but to be in this deep like i don't even know how to explain it like this deep deep satisfaction of the moment of like like there's nothing that can happen to me like you know once you realize that this body is like you know this body will go one day like everybody has an expiration date but this energy that i am this consciousness is going to live forever so like why not approach life with that love and not be fearful of things and just see i think you just open yourself up to more experiences yeah and then when you because you will still i i really believe everybody no matter how much they meditate they will still experience fear and pain and loneliness and things will not go exactly the way they want them to but when we have our practice when we get in the habit of going into the feelings and going into, Hey, this is already happening. 
this is already what's true. Let me be with it. And let me notice, oh, I, I feel fear. When you get into the habit of like, oh, here, I feel fear. Let me give myself compassion. Let me notice that fear. Let me remind myself that everyone feels afraid sometimes. And then be kind to myself, maybe even put my hand on my heart, on my belly and send myself love. Like those kinds of habits help us to enter into the flow so we can make friends with what's happening. It's already happening anyway. We might as well be with what it is. And then that, in my experience, is what helps move situations in, in a positive direction or it helps you open up in a way that creates more freedom for you. I love that. I, I, I think because <clears throat> you were talking about hand over the heart, like you have some exercises in the book that meditations, right? Like that, that work with that. Like, um, I, I really enjoyed the book because of those practical applications that everyone can use because I know I need it for myself. It, it creates the, it creates like these, uh, I don't know. I know it can be hard for people to start new routines, but I need those type of routines in my life, especially when you, you, um, you get into some, some funks, right? Like some, you, you feel like you're in a rut. And it's like these things bring you back to that oneness, right? Like I know for me in the morning, I have to meditate or run either one of the two. And so that way I can kind of set the day on a positive note and know that, you know, reconnect with that. And then I try to do it at night before I fall asleep, just kind of reconnect. Um, but these, these techniques that you talk about, these techniques that we talk about, um, they remind you of your higher higher being because if not if you don't do these things if you don't read these books or if you don't meditate or you eat healthy or whatever whatever you want whatever works for you you kind of fall back asleep yeah and i think that you and and i people who are interested in evolving and shifting what we're doing is we're looking to see how can i shift my energy in a way that will open me up to new feelings or experiences or more possibilities, more opportunities. So things like meditating or practicing self-compassion, which is something I talk about in the book that I learned from a book, another book by Dr. Kristen Neff. Have you ever read her? Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. I really recommend her book uh, to everybody. The, it's called Self-Compassion, The Proven power of being kind to yourself. And I talk about her, one of the core mindfulness exercises that she talks about in that book, which is to, when you notice yourself suffering in any way, fear, self-criticism, even like hunger or impatience that you stop and notice, and that's placing your hand on your heart, sending yourself love and noticing. And she has a, a four things she says, which, which she counsels you to say, which are, this is a moment of suffering. So that's like just acknowledging here it is. I'm suffering. This is a moment of suffering. And then suffering is a part of life. So then we remember, because I think that's a cause of suffering often is that we think, what's my problem? Like I should be past this by now. Or why are all my friends on Instagram having a great day, obviously from their picture and I'm not because something's wrong with me and I'm the only one suffering. It's just not true. Everyone suffers. So this is a moment of suffering. Suffering is a part of life. And then may I be kind to myself and may I give myself the compassion I need. Mm, that's some good stuff right there. What does the Buddha say? Suffering is what attachment or something like that? Suffering. All life is suffering. <laughs> that's the first of the Buddhist pre eight Buddhist precepts, which I think all life is suffering. I don't know. Maybe it's different in the translation, but I feel like it maybe is more accurate to say all life contains suffering. Contains suffering. It depends on how you look at it, I guess. Different perspective. Like I know my suffering was always resulted resulted in my attachments to things. Mm -hmm. And then once you kind of step back and you can see that, right? And then just trust yourself. Just trust that things will work out for you. Just like it doesn't matter what it is. It always, and people say this to me all the time, it always, work, it always works out. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. You don't know what I'm going through. It, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everybody does that, you know, but it's like, if you truly do trust yourself, that your higher self, your higher, like your consciousness, whatever you want to call it, source, universe, cosmos has your best interest at heart, no matter what it is, like there's a lesson to be learned. And if you haven't 
like if you don't ever if you don't look back and you say oh man that was a that was a that was a good lesson i'm, I'm glad i experienced that then you're probably not out of it yet um i don't know uh, yeah what what did that make me think of um, i don't know you had a you had a really really large insight there you're getting ready <laughs> um the suffering the attachment mm, i don't know mm. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I'm, a, I became attached to this book, Tess. How can people find Aww. out more about you and how can they find the book? Thank you. Um, so my book is just about, oh, it will be out by the time this podcast is out. It's out. It's in all the stores, wherever you buy books. And you can find me at TessWhitehurst.com. You can, from there, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And I also have a podcast called Magic Monday Podcast that I host with my friend, Natasha Levenger. Check it out. Make sure to hit subscribe on that podcast and leave a rating in a review. It helps her helps her scale the podcast. It helps her get this out to those who may need it the most. Um, Tess, I can't thank you enough for joining. Thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. This was so fun.